Um, but you guys, if you type in guest, you will see um, this page. Now again, it is a little bit added. Uh, this one's not. This one, I actually, I was actually over on this one first. Um, this looks like a. This looks like a scientist's space site. Um, actually, this is this is what they look like. Um, at least he has hyperlinks in here too. That actually made that very easy. Um, but yeah, so he teaches at the University of Nevada. Uh, Nevada, Nevada? No, that's not it. Nevada, Las Vegas. Hello. There you go. Yeah. So we're gonna talk about this, and hopefully, all my information just saved. And let me get him on Discord. Okay, so let me see. Let me unmute my stuff here. Let me go to my voice. Um, automatically. Sorry, guys. This is how we test things. Okay. Hey, Sean. Hey, fluffy pants. Actually, let me go grab some more coffee real quick, guys, and uh, we'll start this. I'm going to take my face away so you guys can maybe just see, and you probably can't see this too much, can you? Hopefully you guys can. Um, I don't know if my... Hold on. Actually, let me do something real quick here. Yeah, that, that looks decent. So anyways, my stuff's hidden up here, but that's fine too. I don't care. So this is who we're going to talk to. Yeah, real quick. Um, I just need to go get a little bit more coffee, and then we will start this. So I will be right back. Okay. So, I'm going to keep... He's going to be able to hear himself a little bit in my mic, because my input and output are the same. But hopefully that's not too much of an issue. And we're going to talk about some of this stuff with the Kepler stuff. Okay, so I'm going to give him a call. You guys have to tell me how the volume sounds. 
Hello? Hey. Oh, okay. There you are. Sorry. I have... I had no to... problem. Okay. So you can hear me okay? Does it sound okay to you? Yeah, that's no problem. I'm going to turn my volume down on my computer. Okay, I also turned you quite a bit. It's not your fault necessarily. I There's a like four different ways I can turn down the volume for Discord. I know. Um, so where are we going to, Skype? Well, we're going to talk about this stuff first. Um, we're going to talk about some of the things. I'm going to have him kind of give like an introduction to what he does. He's been in our, our chat. He can even say hi in Twitch chat if he wants. Um, and he actually is a teacher. He's a professor at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And so he's going to talk about what he kind of does. And we're going to talk mostly about Kepler, but uh, there's other stuff. Like if anybody has any of the questions that I just don't even touch because I'm not qualified to touch them. See, he just said, hi, Twitch chat. There he is. Um, and yeah, like like dark energy and dark matter. I know there's some new stuff coming up and that they're going to be actually measuring some of that stuff. Some of the dark stuff as much as they can. I've actually listened to a podcast uh, called, oh, what is it? Oh my goodness, with Dam uh, it has uh, Pamela, Dr. Pamela Gay. What is it? Astronomy cast. Yeah, that's it. With Fraser Kane. Um, so they, they talk about a lot of that stuff. So you guys can hear him though. His keyboard. <laughs> Joe. <laughs> His keyboard's good. It's good. So um, yeah, you can go ahead and I've, I've got some things that we can, I'll pull up here too. I've got a bunch of things he also came up with on. Um, Something, I, I abbreviate it because I call it TTV, but he'll go into that too because that's a transit method that is pretty cool. Okay, you can... Should I type stop? <laughs> no. Doogie Hauser's is good. Okay, so you can go ahead and just start talking. They can probably hear you. Okay. Sure. Uh, so I'm, uh, my name is Jason Steffen. I'm, I go by Horizon, um, which was actually the name of my computer when I was a graduate student. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, so I've kept it ever since then. Um, when I was originally in graduate school, I was supposed to be working on uh, what the image of the galactic center black hole would look like. That was supposed to be my dissertation topic. And we had a practice problem. My advisor said, well, we have this practice problem um, after you take general relativity, um, then you can start working on the real problem. We'll do this practice problem. And the practice problem was something related to exoplanets. And eventually, uh, that turned into a dissertation and got me onto the Kepler mission. It was turned out to be more interesting than we originally anticipated. Um, so I've been on the Kepler mission since about 2008. Um, was there when it launched and have been able to help um, with a whole, I've been able to work with people that are amazing and to help with a number of studies. Um, the group that I co-chair um, has published uh, like 60 some odd papers altogether um, related to discoveries from the Kepler mission. So um, should I say a little bit about what specifically I've done for the Kepler mission? Is that? Yeah. So, I mean, just so I'll just tell you guys a little bit about the Kepler mission um, that I know about. He's going to have more details, but do you see how long this piece of like my notepads are serious notepads. This is like my full torso, I'm pretty sure. But um, yeah, so the Kepler mission, you said you were with it with from about 2008. So it, it did launch in March of 2009, I believe. Now, some yeah, of this right. I am recalling from memory. So, But he's going to correct me. Guys, this is why we have him here. Um, but yeah, so it was originally planned for what, like three, three and a half years originally? Yeah, it was a three and a half year mission. Um, it has so Kepler steers with two different mechanisms. One is it, it can steer with hydrogen gas. Mm -hmm. So if it needs to change its what's called the attitude or the orientation, um, it squirts out some gas, and that's one way to steer it. Mm -hmm. And the other one is with reaction wheels. So those are the gyros that it was um, the wheels. The wheels. There was problems with wheels, wasn't there? Yeah. So it had enough. It had enough gas, like hydrazine, to last for almost ten years. It was good with gas, um, guys. It, was good it, with had, gas. it had a lot of gas, um, and then. Uh, but what ended up happening was both the backup wheel and one of the regular wheels failed. And so then it wasn't able to point as stably as it needed to in order to do the science that it was commissioned for. Right. So and it's still operating. Right, right, right. They started, they started using it for another thing, I believe. 
Yeah, uh, the K2 mission. The K2, is the, right. The, it's the reincarnated Kepler mission, and that's actually kind of interesting as well, because mm -hmm. what with with only two reaction wheels, it can only um, steer along a line mm -hmm. in fine point, and so what they do is they balance it against the light coming from the sun. The light comes from the sun, reflects off of the telescope, and pushes it. You get radiation pressure that steers the telescope in, in one direction, and then they use the reaction wheels to correct along that same direction. Um, so that's so, so that cool. Was, that's so neat. <laughs> how, how you resurrect a telescope that's kind of limping along. Right, right. And I, and I think, yeah, I know that there was some, I think, what, was it in like 2013 that it started having these problems with the, the wheels? They cut yeah, it. it they cut it like fail because I was interviewing for faculty jobs right at that oh, time. Oh man! Oh man! <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. And I, I remember I remember reading about that and then thinking, you know, well, that's that's just horrible because I mean this this mission um, was using I, I I think it was what it does is it guys is it measures. I mean I'm not going to use the specific term. I can I can, um, but I know that it's it's going to sound. Um, is it photometry? Uh, it uses photo yep. yeah, it's going to use photometry, guys, to look at exoplanets. And and what we were first looking at, or, or and again, correct me if I'm wrong with this, uh, is we were looking for Earth-like planets, pl mostly, you know, planets in the Goldilocks zone. So, you know, that, that nice, not too hot, not too cold, not too far away from the star, not too close. Um, and they also wanted to see other systems as well, because obviously space is pretty diverse. And so... And, and looking at those orbits and how, how elongated are, are those orbits, how do these things behave, um, I think they wanted to study that. And so um, looking and, and using light, how we observe it um, through this telescope, I think it was originally, usually when we have these um, orbiting telescopes, we usually plop them into the Lagrange, one of the Lagrange points, or Lagrange, people can say it different. Um, I think it's Lagrange. Lagrange. I agree. It's I think the, there's some. Appropriate. Yeah, it's 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 very French. Um, but you know, there's there's different locations at which you can park these, and and we have one. We do that with Hubble. I think they originally thought to put this guy in in L two is what we would call it, but but they think and this again, this is just all from memory. It was something that they wanted. Uh, it was more efficient to have it in a in a behind behind earth orbit around the sun. So it was going slower than our orbit, right? Yeah, so it, it's on a, it's on, it orbits the sun, right. Kepler orbits the sun instead of the earth. Right. Um, and it orbits the sun in 54 weeks instead of 52. So it's slightly farther out than- Like 370 um, than some days or something, right? Yeah, and part of that is the, the mission itself had a cost cap. Of course, we, it was blown by by a bit, um, but the cost cap limited the amount of fuel that you could have on the launch vehicle. Um, and so this was one of the, the main point is that they needed to get it away from the Earth because the Earth is, um, in this case with Kepler, all it does is count photons. It just measures the amount of light coming from another right, star. Right. It doesn't take pretty pictures. In fact, the pictures are defocused. They took the image and blurred it intentionally mm -hmm. um, in order to, um, be able to measure very precisely the number of photons that were coming from all the target stars. Right here, and I got, um, I put it right up here, what it, what it would look like taking a picture. I mean, they have found some exoplanets, guys, through direct imaging. That's one of the methods. That is one, but it's not a common, like, he's going to talk about some of the, and I'm going to try my best here, but, like, you know, this is, like he's saying, it looks like a blob. Like, this is exactly how this looks. Um, and, again, any content that you guys see here, I will have it linked in this VOD, so you guys can always go back to it when you go to the, you know, information. If you click on it, it will have this all there. So, if you're like, oh, that's really cool, I want to see that, and also if you want to see any of the stuff that he has or any of that, um, it will all be there because this is not my material. <laughs> so, and I'm very, very big about making sure to give credit to those who actually do this stuff. Um, but yeah, so this, so this is what you're saying with direct imaging. Like this, this is what it is. Are you seeing my screen right now? Yeah, I can see. So with, with direct imaging, um, there are a number of challenges with direct imaging. The main one is that the star is so much brighter than the planet. Um, for the most part, when you actually just image the planet itself, you have to observe it in a wavelength where the planet is brighter. Um, and you also have to observe young planets that are still cooling down. And how would or you do Kepler, that without a coronagraph? Like, you can, I mean... um, can you do it without? So you can do it with... 
I think you can't. I think just coronagraph is the only way that I know of to okay. do it. There are different varieties of coronagraph. So a okay. coronagraph is something that just blocks the star. There you guys go. Um, Sorry, I, I used to turn. It's a dot in the middle of the telescope, and you point your telescope so that that dot covers the star, mm -hmm. and then you see the light that surrounds the star. Right. Um, and there's different ways of blocking the light from the star. Um, one of them is just to put something in the way. Other ones are, are to design a special, like a vector coronagraph that does weird things with the light polarization. Um, and that that's not something that I actually understand all that well. I mean, yeah. I, I know how it works. I know people that work on them, but um, that's not my gig. Uh, the Kepler, what Kepler does is look for transits, which is when the planet itself passes in front of the star and blocks a portion of the star's light. And so the star gets dimmer as it, as it blocks a portion of the light. Right, and so I'm showing the transit method now. It's the most common method, guys. Like, this is how most of them are found. And I, I showed you guys this. I showed you, like, the really high-tech way with my super cool iPhone. And I showed you on, on stream if I do this and I blind everybody. But if that my hand passes in front of it, it dims. And there's, you know, a, a period at which this becomes... You know, they can study it. How many, and, and this is something I'm curious about. Um, so some of these, and he's going to go into this, I'm sure, because we're going to talk about this um, pretty in depth. Like, how many of these transits do you guys have to have? Is it like, I'm pretty sure it's got to be at least over three or before you could so say three is, it's something. Yeah, three is what it takes, or what it originally would take to become a candidate, like a likely planet, um, was three transits. The main reason was... Uh, you needed to specify the orbital period, like how often, it, how long it takes to go around the star. Right. And there are gaps in the data, and so you have to measure three, um, three transits because that gives you two separate measurements of the orbital period, and those have to line up. Gotcha. Yeah. So you have no. The time between the first and second tran transit, and the time between the second and third, and those have to be the same length. Right. And there, there's pretty dramatic ones that you've seen, right? So tell, I'm just curious, what is one of the most um, exaggerated orbits that you've seen, like so the with, longest. With Kepler, um, there are, Kepler saw so many strange things that people didn't really expect to find. Um, and in terms of planets, all Kepler measures is the shape of the light curve as the planet, like how, how the star dims and how much it dims uh, and how much it dims as a function of time. And those that tells you a lot of stuff about how big the planet is compared to the star, how quickly it's orbiting, and you can get some information about uh, the elongation of the orbit, but it's actually kind of limited information. Mm -hmm. What I did for the mission, and what, what ended up being, I think, more important than any of, us, any of us originally anticipated, was that if there's multiple planets in a system, then those planets interact with each other. Oh, right, the resonance. change the orbital period from one orbit to the next. The orbital period will change slightly. Right. Um, because the planets are interacting with each other. I have this. I brought this up because I already, I know about this. I, I've heard of TTV. That's what you're getting into. Um, yeah, so my, my biggest contribution. This is it, guys. Watch this video while he's talking about it. Watch this video because this is what it's about. This is TTV. Go ahead and talk about it. Yeah, so um, my biggest contribution to the field of exoplanets was shortening transit timing variations to the acronym TTV, because um, otherwise our initial paper would have been three or four more pages long. Um, so the idea is that when planets interact with each other, and this happens in the solar system, we can measure it in the solar system. Um, when the planets interact with each other, it changes. Sometimes it causes the inner planet's orbit to speed up a little bit or to slow down a little bit. Um, and so those differences in the measured orbital period, the time interval between the transits, uh, you can use that to reverse engineer the system and infer the orbital properties of the perturbing planet, the one that's causing the inner or the one that it's interacting with. Right. And so this was, um, in some cases, the planet's orbital periods changed by as much as 10%. Um, I think that's the largest one. So you can imagine in the solar system, if the Earth's orbital period changes by 10%, that over the course of a decade, you would have a year that was missing a month and a year that had an extra month. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're pretty huge. In some cases, the deviations were so large that the planet search algorithm missed the planets um, because the planet, uh, the orbital periods didn't line up from one orbit to the next. Right. And so, so what I'm to, showing they here had to is near the pipeline to see it. Yeah. Kind of what what happens there is because, guys, when when these planets interact with one another, 
this is you can have a planet that is actually sped up as another planet gets close to it it gets accelerated um and the another planet can actually get slowed down depending upon you know their mass and whatnot and their effect that they have but that's why this is so important um with with i mean that the ttv was a great thing to have uh with these missions because that you have to account for that and you know a lot of these systems ended up being um not just one planet um and sometimes not just one star right you guys found out there was a lot of different stars um yeah in in some cases uh with kepler we were able to see um binary stars so the the statement the famous statement is that three out of every two stars in the sky is in a binary um and in some cases we've seen a binary star system with planets orbiting both stars um we've also seen like planets orbiting one star and planets orbiting the other star we've also seen situations where you have two stars orbiting each other and a planet orbiting both stars simultaneously um there's about a dozen of those that have been discovered so far that's amazing but that's i mean i hear that these things are super common also the um what was the other one that's really common is the uh gosh i'm trying to think about well, okay, so the so circumbinary is the the circumbinary circumbinary planets, right? That's going to be what the most common. Um, so that's I don't know if it's the most common. Uh, those are the hardest ones to measure uh, oh, because bet. the signal it looks different every time the planet orbits because the stars are in a different configuration. Um, but that's basically what Tatooine is: is a circumbinary planet, um, right? And then I mean, but we I mean we're recently finding out also like you know the Alpha Centauri system. Um, we, we've recently confirmed that that is actually a three star system, like confirmed all the way. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that, that this actually yeah, passed peer review. It's like, this is, this is something we we're pretty sure about. Um, yeah. Alpha Centauri. In, in fact, if you think of the, the most famous stars in the sky, so the brightest one is Sirius right. and that's a binary star system. The, the Polaris is a triple star system. Um, Alpha Centauri is the closest one. That's a triple star system. Polaris, our North uh, Star, guys, just in case you're wondering, Polaris is the North Star. So um, for now, then it'll be Vega. Now. Then it'll be Vega. Wait, wait around wait around for 1,000 or yeah, 2,000 or 3,000 years. Yeah, just give it some time, guys. And that, that that's why astrology is a very relevant thing. <clears throat> um, <laughs> but uh, yes, yeah, so, but there was something you said, because you, you have a, a TED talk that you did, and I did want to show that too, but I, I can wait. Actually, I want to talk to you first, and then I'll show that. But um, as far as how many stars there are, um, let's let's talk about Kepler's field of view, and then we'll get mm -hmm. back into these these transit or these detection methods because there's other ones. Obviously, like there's the, I believe it's called the radial uh, velocity, which which is basically measuring just uh, the the wobble because stars mm -hmm. stars move, guys. I don't know if you know this, but you know our sun is actually tilted about seven degrees on it has its own axis and uh, they move. If you have a big enough planet next to it, uh, a star can be jostled by the the, the planets. Um, so. Um, and that's one way of detecting these things, but we'll, we can get into that. I want you to just talk about the, uh, the field of view, uh, for Kepler. I know it's, I think it's like what, 100 and 115. It's about a hundred square degrees. I don't, I don't know the, yeah, I only know it to one significant figure. Right. Um, so it's it, the Kepler field of view is a hundred square degrees, which by astronomical standards is enormous. It's way um, bigger than Hubble, right? Yeah. Hubble is. Like how many Hubble images could you fit inside the Kepler field of view? It's probably many, many, probably tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands um, of Hubble uh, fields of view inside the Kepler field of view. So 100 square degrees is basically the size of the palm of your hand if your arm is extended um, at full length. Mm -hmm. um, it's about one four hundredth of the sky. And in that... Uh, the Kepler's camera is quite big. Kepler's camera is about the size of um, about the size of a TV monitor. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a digital camera that's the size of a TV monitor. And they the camera is so big that there was no way for them to download full images. And so they specified each target. They chose the targets by doing an initial ground-based survey. They chose 150,000 or so um, targets. And then they would only download an average of 30 pixels from each of those targets. So they, they never downloaded, or 
they only rarely downloaded full frame images, like a whole picture taken by the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. They would just download the pixels that corresponded to the targets that they were looking at. Right, and this, and I have an image right up of uh, Cygnus. It's one of the constellations, guys. Cygnus, the Swan, um, and it just kind of shows what Hubble. I'm not Hubble. Sorry, Kepler is actually looking at, and and it stares at this spot in the sky, right? For how long? How long does Kepler look at this? So or it stared it? at it for four years, um, in all told. Uh, it would rotate once every 90 days. Um, well, roughly 90 days. It was about 100 days because of its longer orbit. Uh, and that was to keep the solar panels pointed towards the sun. Um, and the footprint of the Kepler camera was one where if you rotate it, it's basically the same footprint. It's not one completely solid digital camera. It's composed of several different chips, right. 42 chips that are all lined up. And so... You know, with with each of these, I think you said something in the TED talk, and it's going to be. I'm gonna. I'm, I just want to hear it. Uh, you said, for every grain of sand um, on Earth, like you could say, there's ten stars for every grain of sand on all of the beaches and all the deserts, right? On the Earth, yeah. Yeah. So it's a it's a huge number of stars out there. <laughs> there's that's a lot. Just, that's just the visible universe. That's, and yeah, right. That's that's, that's our observable. That's 13.82 billion years. You know, there's. Um, yeah, and that number keeps getting bigger over time. But uh, yeah, so that's that's incredible. So if you just say that, and and that's just I like to really just melt people's minds in here and have them walk away where they're like questioning what everything is. But um, and so Kepler was looking just at this spot in the sky, and uh, I think I, I wrote down these numbers. Actually, I did write these down because these were pretty big numbers. It's way too many for me to remember. Um, so yeah, so it, the stars in its field of view, guys, and and you can confirm this about a half a million stars, right? It was in its field yeah, of view. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, and then, but they and then focused that's whittled down to right, about one hundred and fifty thousand targets. Right, hundred. So they whittled. They they didn't. They don't have the time or the manpower or everything to look at you know a half a million stars, guys, in that field of view. So they decided we're just going to cut this down to one hundred and fifty thousand stars, and we're going to look at those, and then. Um, that it was about, it was even taken down to, uh, saying about out of, out of those 150,000 stars that they were looking at 90, roughly 90,000 of them were G type stars, which is a spectral type. Um, you guys remember the acronym that I always say that's really eloquent. Um, but it's a spectral type. It tells you a lot about that star. And we look at our sun is a G type star, um, it being a yellow dwarf star, um, so it, those are sun-like stars. That's how we would classify a G-type star. Um, so, you know, there's about 90,000 out of those, 150,000 is, is what I, I was reading about that. Yeah, it was the, the main purpose of the mission was to find essentially Earth twins, to measure the frequency of Earth twins, which is an Earth-sized planet on a one-year orbit around a solar-type star. Mm -hmm. um, and stars... I guess the definition of solar type is based upon what the star looks like on the inside. Mm -hmm. um, if you get stars that are too 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 much smaller than the sun, then they basically boil all the way to the center. Right. And if you get stars that are much larger than the sun, then there's no boiling at all. It's completely radiative, um, right. is what they call it. Right. And so solar type stars are ones that have both. It has a core. It has a radiative zone where photons basically just diffuse outwards. Mm -hmm. um, and then it has a, a convective layer near the surface. And so those are F, G, and K type stars um, that are basically, the surface temperature um, runs from some number to some other number that people who really care about it know. But it's, a, it's right. around, it centers around uh, 6,000 Kelvin, which is basically where the sun is. Right, and I'm showing, again, you guys have seen this so many times on my stream. Um, I'm keeping myself over the the y-axis because it's not really relevant. That's that's luminosity and that's different. Um, but we're talking about the spectral type down here. Barrick, you got it. You absolutely got it. Uh, so these 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 letters down here are all in, indicative of how the star is, like you said, on the inside. Whether you have a convective star um, or whether you have one of these, you know, O class stars or B class stars. Um, they're all they all behave differently, and and they have actually their life and how how we know. How they live out their life is determined by this diagram, um, and there's a nice linear curve here. It's very, very interesting. Um, but 
Okay, so see, he's already, he's already, he's already, he, see, he's, he's going in with the Pluto, and, and, and now I'm, I'm all distracted, I just can't even, don't, I, just seeing Pluto cry like that does nothing anymore, I'm desensitized. Um, so, so back to the transit methods, though, um, mm -hmm. so I have this here, oh, that's nice, I didn't really, so, you guys, we haven't even practiced this, this is going so nice and fluid, I had no idea it was going to be this good, but, we, uh, there's the detection methods. We talked about the transit, which you guys remember is the, the light going in front of, or the light being blocked by a planet. Um, and you guys saw that mostly with things like, that's easy to see with bigger planets. And if they're, especially if they're close to their host star, like, like a hot Jupiter, right? That was probably what you guys first started picking up with the Kepler mission. And yeah, those were the easiest things to find. And the first and weird, several weird. discoveries. But those are weird, right? Because we have Jupiter at 5 AU, guys, and 1 AU is 93 million miles. It's the distance between the sun and the Earth. Um, Jupiter is at 5 AU. So um, Jupiter's chilling way back there. And, and these things would be just pretty much, um, you know, right up in the star's face, Jupiter-like planets, right? Yeah, the surface temperature of a hot Jupiter like the temperature at the cloud tops of a hot Jupiter would be something like uh, 20,000 Fahrenheit. Um, so that's, it's pretty hot. And it's not a place where these planets can form. Hot Jupiters, which were the first of any planet to, this, to be discovered, um, except for the ones around the pulsar, um, around a main sequence star, a star like the sun, the hot Jupiters were the first ones to be discovered. And uh, that's basically because they're the easiest. They're heavy and they're close to the star. Um, but they can't have formed there because in order to form a Jupiter, you have to be far enough away for things like water and ammonia and methane to condense from a gas phase into a liquid phase. Um, and that only happens out at several times the orbital distance to the Earth. Right, right, right. And I mean, those 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 atmospheres are just pretty much just radiated away. Like they're just right. I mean, they might even leave tails like like a comet. Um, yeah. And, and in fact, there are. It's been measured. Um, you can measure the atmosphere boiling off of the hot Jupiters. In fact, in some cases, there are planets, not hot Jupiters, but planets going around the star where it's boiling off the rock. The, the rock is, um, it's so hot that the rock is vaporizing and there's a stream of, of stuff that's coming off the back of it that you can detect from the Kepler telescope. That's, yeah, and that's crazy. And so those are the first ones. And so, yeah, so we would... I mean, that's probably when we started talking about, you know, these were probably the first planets to form in that system. But then we're wondering, that brings, see, this is why space is so cool is because that brings more questions like, why is Jupiter where it is? And now that we've actually, um, recently there's been a paper that did pass peer review as well, saying that Jupiter was in fact the most likely the, uh, the first planet to form in our solar system. Um, and that makes sense. Yeah, that's the, yeah, right? the way that planets form, um, in order to form something that's made mostly out of gas, it has to form within the time that the gas disk exists. And that only is like 5 million years. Right. And uh, the terrestrial planets, they can form long after that because um, once the gas dissipates, you're just left with the rocks, and those rocks start bumping into each other and, uh, and coalescing to form Earth-sized planets. So th those were the first kind of planets that were formed. Uh, one quick thing I wanted to go back and mention that, like, one of the most more famous planetary systems, at least in recent in the recent news, is the Trappist system. Yes. And the trap the Trappist system named used... after a beer. It was. Yeah. Did you not know that? Did you? Oh my gosh! You didn't know that? Yeah, it was totally named after a beer. It totally was. <laughs> Absolutely, guys. Trappist beer is actually uh, really good. I'll have to talk to because I think it's a it's a European team that's doing a lot <laughs> of the work. Um, and so that the Trappist system. For measuring the masses, they did transit timing variations. That's how they measured the masses of the planets in that star. Um, Belgian astronomers who found planetary systems named it after a beer. I have it up right here. So, <laughs> Guys, this is why science is so good. I'm kidding. But no, but it is true. So it usually, is true. <laughs> okay, go I mean, on. Typically, the way most, most any mission works out is you have to come up with an acronym first and then figure out what sentence fits it. Um, so like, oh, we're going to do saxophone. And then, okay, what are we going to have all the letters stand for? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. 
So Michael Guillon at Liège, um, which is so Liège University is Liège is where the good Belgian waffles are from, because there's two different kinds of Belgian waffles, and Liège is where the good ones are from. Yeah, yeah, no, it's Belgian beers are, are amazing. So of course these are Belgian astronomers. It's a type of beer. Yes, my my chat's confirming this. And Jen, I will tell you, I I will be around after. We'll take some questions about stuff. Um, I'll talk about. I can talk about Mars later. Um, we're just getting started, but yeah, we're. We're talking about um, uh, exoplanets and the Kepler mission right now and kind of his work that he did. We have, uh, if I could get somebody to do exclamation point guest up in here. Um, we have Dr. Stefan on here, and he's a professor at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Um, so go on, though, with what you were saying. Oh, so the TRAPPIST system, uh, so we use transit timing variations to measure the masses in the TRAPPIST system. So going back to the second line, was uh, hot Jupiters were the first things that were discovered, but because we already knew that they existed, they weren't necessarily the most interesting. So if you go, um, so there's Kepler one, Kepler planets one, two, and three, they were ones that had already been discovered in the Kepler field of view. Mm -hmm. And then there were a whole bunch of very early announcements. And I remember, in fact, we're writing, we're currently writing a bit of a history of the Kepler mission. And so I went back, I've gone back through my emails from 2009 and 2010 when when we were like drinking from the fire hose as the data were coming down. <laughs> and um, the an initial discoveries, there was a lot of, it was really important that we get it right. It was the team collectively were very concerned to make sure that every planet that we announced was a real planet um, so that we didn't have kind of egg on our face from having to retract discoveries. Right. Um, so the first nine or the first eight were basically the same kind of planet. But beginning at Kepler nine, there was a series of really um, kind of breakthrough papers that were um, kind of milestone discoveries. Kepler-9 was the first one. That was the first planet that was uh, confirmed as a planet using transit timing variations. So transit timing variations, the paper that my advisor and I did um, was published in 2005. Mm -hmm. And then the first discovery I guess the first real application of that was done in 2010 um, with Kepler-9. Kepler-10 was the first rocky planet that Kepler discovered. Mm -hmm. um, and that planet orbits uh, once every 20 hours. So gotcha. it, it has less than a one-day orbit around its host star. Uh, and then the, the third one, well, there's a jet. I, I think you're one. in space now. <laughs> so I'm, I'm at my parents house right now um <laughs> family and it's right next to an air force base so. oh, okay um <laughs> he's the, really passionate about space guys <sighs> so the uh the third one that was kind of in this series was the kepler 11 system and that's the one that's become the poster child of transiting planetary systems uh for a while for several years it was almost obligatory that you have an image of the kepler 11 system at all your conference talks so that you could say oh here's what transiting planets look like um so that was Kepler-11. So all, all these discoveries kind of came right in the first few years um, as we were, to some extent, we were trying to grapple with the fact that we were getting so much data right, um, right. and so much information that how do you deal with this? Um, and in fact, for the first few years, we were, for every planet announcement, there was a whole lot of ground-based like Doppler measurements to measure the the Doppler motion of the star. So that's the radial velocity method. Right, that's the wobble um, method, guys. So remember I said that's one of the detection methods. I'm going to bring it up over here. Da, 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 where is it? Okay, radial velocity. Search. Yeah, so this is this is how they say right here on this site that 639 planets discovered through this method. So stars move. I mean, everything's moving. Everything's moving, everybody. Everything, everything, everything is. Um, so... Stars can actually be manipulated by the planets orbiting them as well. So this is how one of the detection methods. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. So the first discoveries always had some major component of um, using extra information to confirm the planets. And so as a consequence, the new discoveries were coming out slowly. Um, even though we would have thousands of objects that were good planet candidates, we weren't able to move them, elevate them from just candidates to bona fide planets um, because as, as you've mentioned, there's so many binary stars in the galaxy that every, um, 
it's easy to mimic a planet transit signal by having a binary star in the background that happens to coincide with the target star that you're looking at. That's yeah, kind of binary stars website. just mess this up, guys. It makes it really difficult, really difficult. And that's that's most of star star systems are. I mean, binary stars are are these two stars orbiting each other. Uh, this is very, 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 very common in space. In fact, uh, just real quick, just to segue off of that, did you hear that they're, they're, I think, I don't know if that paper actually went out, but um, that they say that, no, it did. It was on phys.org um, with the every star being born in pairs. Did you read about that? Uh, so I'm not totally convinced that I buy, I mean, so in the scientific literature, the way that things work is um, there are always a bunch of ideas. Like people try to push the envelope and say, you know, what would happen if this and what would happen if that. Right. And so I math. believe that that study, I'm trying to think. <laughs> I think um, they use some mathematical models. the authors models. were on that study. Yeah, I have it. I can find it real quick here, like super fast. You want, you want to Google race me? Are you Google racing me right now? Uh, we'll find out. So <laughs> all Stars born in pairs. <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. It's, uh, I should do the fizz.org one, man. Because I was totally, I was reading this while I was on my vacation thing. Right here. Here we go. Yep. There we go. This one. Okay, I saw one in Berkeley. Yeah, there was um, one at UC Berkeley, But they're all the too. same. I mean, right. it, it, once it hits the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're talking about all this stuff. Um, so they had some mathematical models. Now, again, I don't think, I don't know if this is, I mean, I, I've been pretty careful about saying this is hard science because that's the cool thing about science. While we, we make a lot of claims that this is how maybe this came about or whatever, we're, um, I think Neil deGrasse Tyson's the one that said that, you know, we don't ever leave the drawing board. Where I was pretty much there, just you know, and we as a collective, we being just everybody that that makes contributions uh, to all science. of humanity, all of humanity, everybody, it's all of us. Um, so we certainly know that all stars form. Well, okay, the overwhelming majority of stars form in clusters, uh, like the Pleiades cluster um, is the be is a good example. Mm -hmm. um, so all stars form in these in blobs. Uh, so there's a blob of, of gas that collapses and the stars nucleate out of that and, and form in clusters. And then if there isn't enough material to keep that bound, then the cluster evaporates over time as stars kind of get kicked out. Right. Um, and that's, and as a consequence of kicking stars out is oftentimes you'll, I mean, they even call it ionization. You'll take a binary star and the stars will get pulled apart as they interact gravitationally with one of their neighbors. Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, it's certainly plausible that our sun formed in a binary. Um, I don't, I mean, it's, it would be very difficult to have conclusive evidence. That yeah, that it happened. would be. Yeah. Right. Right. That's true. And, um, you know, this whole nemesis thing, it's one of those things on the internet that I'm constantly saying just no. Um, like let's, let's just stop talking about things that we actually just don't know on and, and and there's there's always a possibility like he's even saying like there's a possibility but we just there's nothing that would be really hard to to nail down um planet nine is looking more tangible to to nail down but even that is going to be quite a feat if there is indeed something like that and again i'm saying mm -hmm. if there is um emphasis on if and um but yeah so we got radial velocity we got we got stars moving because planets are 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 moving stars and that, that, that's a way you can detect these, but it gets difficult, obviously, when you have multiple stars in a system or if you have multiple stars and multiple planets orbiting multiple stars. <laughs> mm -hmm. Space gets a little yeah, I mean, complex, guys. There are systems, there are definitely star systems that have... So in, uh, in the Big Dipper, the, there's, where the handle bent is bent in the Big Dipper is a... It looks like... Okay, if you're not in Las Vegas, if you're in Rocky Mountain National Park, you should be able to see that there are actually two stars where the handle of the Big Dipper is bent. Each of those stars is actually a multi-star system. The small one is a, two, is a binary star system. The large one is two binary star systems that are orbiting each other. So there's a total, and then the two, the smaller binary and the quadruple system are also orbiting each other. So it's actually six stars that are orbiting around each other in that one part of the Big Dipper. 
So which ones are I have the big I have the big dipper pulled up right now. It, so it's, it's where the handle is bent. So okay, so here it looks like it's bent here. Um just give that stream delay that sweet 15 seconds. <laughs> um I think. But it, I mean these are fuzzy. They're they're not going to be very good images. I mean this looks like it's still pretty astrophotography. Um it's real, guys. This is real. Um, and actually it's this in real life, it's, it's real life. We're in the IRL. So, but yeah, this is where it would be bent, right? Where my, my mouse is. Yep. Yeah. So, so that's you're Alcor saying, and Mizar. And so those are two six stars. stars that are orbiting each other. Two, two time guys, two stars right here, right here. Two dose. So yeah, handle that. Okay. <clears throat> so anyways, go on. <laughs> yeah. So, um, having, I mean, ha stars like each other. I guess enough to the, to form together and to stay together. Uh, planetary systems, as far as we can tell, um, planetary systems are everywhere. Um, at le for the kinds of planetary systems that Kepler is able to discover, uh, which is has primarily been planets that are larger than the Earth but smaller than Neptune, mm -hmm. and that have orbits that are tens of days, so like ten days to you know a hundred days or so. And we call those super um, Earths, the, right? Is that what we call those? Yeah, and it's so there's a bunch of names that are being tossed around. Super Earths is kind of the most common one. Um, there's also I prefer Sub Neptune, but it's Mini Neptune is what most people use. I think it. I think Sub Neptune rolls off the tongue a little bit better. I do too. Um, I think Super Earth is is I and that's one of my. I don't know if this bothers you. It probably bothers me way more. Um, just because I talk to a lot of people about this stuff on the internet, and you know, YouTube is a great place to go for all of your information. Um all really good, solid information that's always true about space. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, like, whenever people attach Earth to describing exoplanets, it seems like like a, a, the general public, and it's okay, it's, it's totally fine, because I would say a lot of the responsibility is on people talking about these things and how they're delivering that. You know, Earth-like doesn't necessarily mean habitable. Um, it could it could mean all sorts of things. Um, it could mean that it's a it's a rocky planet. Um, it it doesn't necessarily. I mean, we don't we can't really look at these guys and study their atmospheres until James Webb telescope, right? I mean, do the spectroscopy, yeah. see what and their also, atmospheres are. So the James Webb Space Telescope will be an important instrument for studying their atmospheres. But even then, the Kepler planets aren't really the ones that you're going to want to look at. Um, the uh, there's a new mission that's being launched uh, that should go up sometime next year called TESS. That's the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Mm -hmm. um, TESS is similar to Kepler. It looks for transits. Um, it's an all-sky survey. And the reason that you want to do an all-sky survey is that that allows you to detect the planets closer and therefore brighter. Um, the problem with Kepler is because we wanted to measure planets with orbital periods of one year with Kepler, uh, you had to stare at one part of the sky for four years in order to ensure that you get three transits. And in order to have enough stars to have a good sample, you have to look far away where there's, because the, the farther away you go, the more stars you can fit into the field of view. Right. TESS is going to look nearby, and so it's going to detect brighter stars, but in order to get the same number of stars to, to look at, you have to survey the whole sky. So that's going to fly later this year, or it's supposed to launch sometime in the next year. Um, yeah, it says a two-year survey of the solar neighborhood test will monitor more than 200,000 stars for every, you know, so every drop in brightness, guys, every time that that light from the star is dimmed. Um, that's mm -hmm. crazy. And, and TESS's orbit, um, so we, we talked a little bit about orbits. Uh, so Kepler's orbit orbits the sun mm -hmm. um, and not the Earth. TESS orbits the Earth because it's a lot less expensive to launch a vehicle in orbit around the Earth. Mm -hmm. But it orbits the Earth in a two to one mean motion resonance with the moon. Oh. So the moon's orbit is once every 28 days or so. Mm -hmm. and so TESS orbits on a 14 day orbit such that uh, that way most of its orbit is far away from the Earth where it's not affected by the Earth's magnetic field like the South Atlantic Anomaly, which is this strange place in the Earth's magnetic field that causes all sorts of disruptions of signals from satellites. Right. Um, so it, it goes out, it spends a lot of time far away from the Earth where you don't get temperature fluctuations, um, and so that doesn't change the sensitivity of the camera. To, to first order, Kepler is a 
multi-million dollar thermometer, it's very sensitive to temperature fluctuations because it changes everything. It changes how sensitive the pixels are. It changes how the shape of the spacecraft as things expand and contract with temperature fluctuations. And so you don't want that. So Tess's orbit puts it out where it can stay cold for a long time. Um, and then it clocks around, um, takes, it stares at one part for a month and then clocks a little bit and then stares at another stripe for a month and then clocks a little bit more. And at the cap, the cap of its orbit where all these clock cycles overlap um, is the James Webb continuous viewing zone. So that's where James Webb will be able to look at, it will be able to look all year in that direction. Gotcha. Oh yeah, because so this is saying this is high Earth orbit, so it's not going to be in low Earth, which makes sense. That makes sense with yeah, what low, you're saying. Low Earth about. orbit is hard to do high quality photometry, like measuring photons. Right. Because... Measuring light, guys. Photons, light. Photons, light. Um, typically, if you need to do that around the Earth, uh, they have it orbiting. If you have to do it from low Earth orbit, if you're unfortunate enough to have to do low Earth orbit um, light gathering, uh, they will put it at the terminator. So it orbits right where the sunrise and sunsets are on the Earth. Gotcha. Gotcha. And that... Yeah, so that's that's crazy. I didn't. Why don't I know about? Well, maybe I did know about this. I think I'm too hyped for James Webb. I'm, I'm way t hyped about that one. Um, because that one, guys, like it. That one's gonna be able to let us look at at some of the exoplanets. And like he said, not not a lot of these Kepler ones. Um, but I'm guessing we will be looking at the Trappist system. Um, also because that's so close to us, relatively, relatively, it's about 40 light years away. Um. 39 give or take so um but yeah those that, that's going to allow us to look at not just only atmospheres but we can we can understand so much more about just how the system behaves um watch it over a period of time too the the trappist system is just nuts in and of itself it's very very tightly packed together you can fit all of those planets within the orbit of mercury uh, so yeah, it's all seven of them all seven planets within the orbit of mercury and that's insane um, and also, you know, these, it will, it will tell us more about these, these, uh, you know, uh, cooler stars, these red dwarf stars and how they, how they impact their planets. Cause we, we don't know, we, we've seen, uh, pretty, pretty crazy behaviors from these types of stars, but also stars when, when they're younger, they spin faster and, and they have a tendency to be a little bit more violent. Um, and then when they age, they slow down, um, as everything kind of does. And if I'm, am I wrong about that or am I kind of right? No, about that's that? right. Because, um, the way it works is as the, the star, like, so from the surface of the star, you get the solar wind, um, which is charged particles that leave the star and those charged particles, uh, as they go out, the magnetic field drags them around and, uh, removes angular momentum or spin from the star. And so the stars slow down over time because of this magnetic breaking. Right. And it hasn't been, it's not ready for prime time yet, but a very promising way of measuring the ages of stars is to do what's called gyrochronology, which is you measure how fast the star is rotating, you measure the kind of star that it is on that spectral class, the OBA of GKM. And from that, you can determine how old the star is. Mm -hmm. um, for most main sequence stars, because they sit on the main sequence for 10 billion years and they basically look the same that whole time. Um, it, it's very difficult to get a good age estimate on the star until it um, evolves beyond the main sequence and becomes giant. Right. And so this gyrochronology is, I think it's the most promising method, but it hasn't, it hasn't been uh, hammered out yet. It's still being developed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, Interesting too, yeah. Because I've actually met with somebody who um, is an assistant professor at CU Boulder, um, and he did a whole thing about these these red dwarf stars and how how much radiation they can output. Um, you know that that extra uh, UV, and then there there's some even X-ray. I guess there's like some super extreme UV that they can put out. So just because they're cooler, I guess it doesn't necessarily mean they're more calm and tamer. And that we want to snuggle up and get close to them, um, and, and they live that they stay that way for a long time. Yeah, I mean, they live typical, forever. <laughs> I mean, yeah, well. M dwarf stars, the sun will be born and die before these things basically even make it out of adolescence. Yeah, um, I don't even know if we've even seen one die, have we? No, uh, the uh, an M dwarf. Yeah, there's a no far M dwarf, like one that's um, like a tenth of a solar mass or something like that, will live for 
uh, 10 times longer than the age of the universe. Right. Right. So like Proxima Centauri. Yeah. That's yeah. going to be around for a while. Yeah. That one's going to So I actually did a, down I did here a, um, a paper. One of the papers I worked on was what happened, like where's the last bastion that life could have? And we were looking at uh, the, the possibility of heating a planet from dark matter annihilation in the core mm -hmm. of like the planet um, lives in some dwarf galaxy and accretes dark matter into its core. And then the dark matter, the annihilation of that dark matter heats up the interior of the planet and keeps it habitable. That's the only thing really that has the potential to have life farther out than the um, 10 trillion years of an M dwarf star. Right. And, and I mean, we, we just, I mean, again, these stars are, are, are there, there is fusion, um, but, but it's convective. They're, they're convective stars. Um, they're not, they're not like our star where, you know, you need mass and you need that mass. You need that temperature in order to start fusing heavier elements. So, um, that's, it's kind of crazy. Like this, this main sequence, um, here is, is something that's very linear. It's something in science that we use a lot with astronomy because it's, it's really cool. Like you can tell how stars live. Um, and, and, you know, also when they're born, if they're born around a lot of stuff, they're going to be bigger stars. Um, you know, also the elements that they're born around, that's, that's also relevant. So I know that the, right there, he got a little, I know everybody's like, Oh my God, no, it's okay. I know he's talking about annihilation and, and dark matter. It's okay. Like that's good stuff. Cause I mean, these, these are things that I, I do read about these things, but it's still one of those things I just, I don't really trespass into just because it's one of those things. Um, passionate Matt actually in my chat, he's in school right now for, um, astronomy as well. And so that's, I, we have a lot of people, we have a doctor in here. Who's the one that designs the, the space engine. He's one of the devs for it. Um, but yeah, so, so wait, we, and there's other, one other thing with this and that I was curious about with, with exoplanets and searching for them. So we've, we've talked about the wobble and how that works. That's a method of detecting these exoplanets. Um, we got the transit, which is the most common. And then we've got direct imaging, which is difficult, but we've, we've done it. Um, now, now guys, this is going to get a little bit, but it's, it doesn't have to be complex. I promise. Um, it's something called gravitational micro lensing. Um, and that's using, uh, basically gravity and how gravity can become a, a lens and, and it can, it can actually magnify something so that we can look at something. We do it all the time to look at, at, you know, distant galaxies and stuff and to really study those. Um, what can you say about gravitational lensing? So, uh, Gravitational lensing is used in a number of ways. Basically, what you have is because when you have mass or energy in some region, it distorts space time. So it distorts uh, the way that light travels around it. And you guys have you seen have that with a the black hole. When I move it through space, you guys have seen that in the games, like how it how it actually does that funhouse effect, you know, where it's duplicating. Um, you know, we can we can have it actually duplicate. <laughs> Um, it's, it's just a really weird, it's a fun house effect. That's the way I like to say it, but go on. Yeah. So that, um, one of the things that that can do is make it so that a distant object appears brighter. If you have, so you have a distant object that has some brightness. If you pass another object in between you and that distant object, then it can focus the light from the distant object, um, on your telescope and in doing so, so that distant object will flare up over a period of time and then die back down depending upon how long it takes for that intermediate object to pass along the lensing object to pass across the planet site so that's um my so lensing gravitational lensing is the dis, is the magnification that you get from a, a distorting mass that passes it in front of the line do you of see site. this do you see if this? you have a planet look at my screen real quick this is actually really yeah. cool i haven't even looked at this a lot of this material i just threw up here because i was like It'll be relevant. I didn't know that it was going to be this good. This is this is exactly what he's saying. And actually, I love how they actually uh, put in space time on this, the fabric. Mm -hmm. Like how they, as you guys see, like it's making a dent in that trampoline I always talk about. That that, And that's what happens when you have a massive object. So we make our own dent as we go along the sun. But you'll see here is as, as, as an object has more mass, it's going to, the light coming from that star is going to be distorted by that object moving by. Um, okay, go on. Sorry, yeah. it's just a really, I didn't know that they had this. This is really cool. And so if you have a planet orbiting that star, the lensing star, mm -hmm. um, then the planet can also distort uh, 
can also cause a magnification. And what that will look like is you have your distant object that's your source. It will get brighter as the system goes by, the planetary system goes by and lenses it. And then when the planet goes by, it will have another peak in the brightness. And so that double peak, the one peak from the star and then a smaller peak from the planet is how you can measure um, the presence of a planet around a distant star. The thing with microlensing, um, it doesn't quite get you the same kind of information that you get from uh, these other signals. So when you do the Doppler method or the rate of velocity method and the transit method, you can measure the orbital period. You can measure, there's a number of other things. You can get the mass and stuff like that mm -hmm. from, the, um, from the Doppler signal or from the transit signal. Mm -hmm. With a microlensing event, you only get a single snapshot of a single system. And so in order to understand how planetary systems are built through the microlensing process, you have to build a large sample, a large statistical sample, and then do studies about, um, you know, what's the distribution of orbital periods, what's the distribution of mass based upon our understanding of how stars uh, form throughout the galaxy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, and you see that this isn't a very common detection method. Only 47 planets um, have been discovered uh, using this method. It's probably because yeah, it's so there, tricky, there like you a, said. There is a mission um, called WFIRST, which is going to be a, a fairly significant mission. Um, and that one is going, that's kind of the replacement of the next replacement of Hubble because it's going to be a visible light mission. Mm -hmm. um, where James Webb is more of an infrared mission, right. a near infrared mission. Right. Uh, so the W first. W first is going to have an enormous. Um, it, it will be a very capable instrument. Let me put it that way. And one of the parts of its science agenda is to do microlensing surveys and measure thousands of these microlensing events. Right, and that's um, yeah, that's all pretty. Yeah, that's I haven't really heard too much about that. I've heard that name thrown around a few times, but. Um, yeah, that's that's going to be an interesting one, but because yeah, again, like we just don't have the resources right now to really analyze these. Like you said, we need to get more, um, like you said, the samples, you know, and and look at those. And so, what's this last one though? I don't think I've actually even heard of this one. Astrometry. Astrometry. Okay, so astrometry is astrometry as a science or as a discipline is measuring the positions of stars, and what you can do uh, to detect planets using astrometry is that you have a field of stars and you look for a star to actually change its position over time um, because it has, so planets and stars orbit each other around their common center of mass, mm -hmm. uh, basically where they would balance if, there was, if they were on a teeter-totter mm -hmm. or a seesaw, depending upon where you live in the country. And um, so as this planet orbits around the star, the star will also trace out the shape of the orbit um, although it's much smaller, and as you make those, as you make position measurements, you can actually trace out the um, the orbit of the star, and it, from that infer the presence of the planet. So that's astrometry. It's basically you actually watch, you take a picture of the sky, and you watch the stars physically move with respect to each other. Wow. So there's a mission going on right now um, called Gaia. It's oh uh, yeah 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 I've heard about mission. that one. Mm -hmm. So that's the European Space Agency mission. Um, and Gaia is measuring, doing very high precision astrometry or stellar position measurements for something like, well, it's, it's in the billions. I don't know how many billion, but it's more than, more than one. It's many billions of stars. Billions uh, and about, billions. We'll say billions. that. Billions. <laughs> uh, so there are about 300 billion stars in our own galaxy. And I think this is supposed to measure nearly a quarter of them. So it's, we're looking at like a hundred billion stars almost. Um, and it will be able to detect the presence of outer gas giants, like Jupiter-sized objects, um, out at Jupiter-like orbits, um, by what, tracing out those orbits as the star uh, wiggles or changes its position in the sky. That's one aspect of the science mission for ESA. Um, and I was actually just over at the Torino Observatory a few months ago, and that's where the exoplanet arm of the Gaia mission science agenda is headquartered. Mm -hmm. um, it also does galactic, um, it measures the properties of stars in the galaxy. So beyond planet detection, you can use 
astrometry to measure the motion of the stars in the galaxy and from it pick out galactic structure. You can even do things like, so I, I know you've said this in your stream before, galaxies often merge. Mm -hmm. um, when you form um, a galaxy like the Milky Way, it will happen through mergers of smaller galaxies. Um, and each merger imprints upon the, it takes, so you have the stars from one galaxy as it comes in and merges with the larger galaxy, the stars from the smaller galaxy gets spread out right, and have a different velocity. They have different motion compared to the stars that were already there. And by doing these, this particular mission, this astro astrometric mission, you can identify these, you can discern like between the merger history oh, of the galaxy. Nice. Yeah. You'd be able to discern between, you know, those stars that actually merged in versus the stars that were already there in the, the, the galaxy. So like if we were to say in 4.5 billion years, when Andromeda is coming straight for the Milky Way, we'll be able to see which stars came from the Milky Way based on their velocity change, um, you know, versus the stars that, you know, will, will be in a part of Andromeda, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I'm just throwing it in there, you know, it's a future apart. event that everybody just has to wait around for. It's only 4.5 billion years, guys. Yep. Just wait for a while, and uh, Sit back. We'll, we'll all get to see it front and center. Yep, we'll we'll be here. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's actually really interesting because I, I hadn't really, I mean, I hadn't really heard about this method at all. So it's minuscule movements, but that's really cool that they're going to be able to be able to tell that because I can understand that that would be different, that the motion would be disturbed, probably not uniform between two galactic merging uh, mergers. But um, so. Okay, so question though about this, how many rogue planets? So I know a lot of people are probably like, uh, I don't know if you guys have actually heard of rogue planets. There are a lot of planets that actually get kicked out of solar systems or um, what's another condition that a rogue planet, I only just know about just being kicked out, just just get out of here. Um, um, I, you probably could form them in isolation. Um, we don't actually understand uh, formation of individual objects when you get down to that size. Right. Uh, we understand roughly down to M dwarfs. We don't really understand the formation of uh, the brown dwarfs, like w why there are so few, why does the, why are there so many M dwarfs and so few brown dwarfs? Um, if you think about it, if you think about, for example, the distribution of city populations mm -hmm. in the United States, you have one New York and Los Angeles and Chicago, but then you start getting three or four cities that are the size of like Dallas and, and then you get um, many cities that are a few, like 1 million, which is like the size of uh, Salt Lake city or Las Vegas or something like that. And then you get more and more and more cities, the smaller you go. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing happens with stars. You have a few really big ones and you get more and more and more cities, more and more and more stars, the smaller you go in mass until you get to about, um, I think it's about 0.2 solar masses. And then it turns over and you get fewer and fewer objects that are less massive than that. And that's something that we don't understand. So that's called the brown dwarf desert. Why are there so few brown dwarfs? You right. Normally predict them to be more common right. than M dwarf stars. And they're not. Yeah. M, M dwarf stars. Then that guys would, that means a red dwarf star on, um, they make up where we're estimating about 75% of the stars in the universe um so and you can't see them because they're so dim again on the hr diagram that we were looking at over here um they're going to be these ones down here uh at the bottom right and and they're so they're just not luminous stars and that's going to actually correspond here to the y-axis this is brightness luminosity um and and they're just they're so dim because they're they're just they're red they're cooler stars and they're smaller um, and, but they make up the majority, 75% is, you know, a rough estimate, but I mean, they're, they're very common. And these brown dwarf stars aren't on this, um, diagram there, there would be spectral type L and T. And we talked about that last time I had somebody in here that was like, well, they're not really stars. And, uh, it's, it's weird because actually they do bridge that gap between planets and stars. Um, I think they, right. Yeah. The, the technical, the technical, um, at least in my mind, the te technical distinction between a brown dwarf and a star and a brown dwarf and a planet is that a brown dwarf is not capable of fusing hydrogen into helium. Right. So it's not able to go through the proton-proton chain, which is the process that stars like the sun shine. Right. Um, however, they are heavy enough 
massive enough to fuse deuterium into hydrogen. Mm -hmm. um, and so that eliminates the hardest step of, so the way the sun shines is through the proton-proton chain. You take a bunch of protons, you mush them together and you form deuterium. And from that deuterium, you form helium. And so there's this process that you go through. Right. The hardest step, the step that takes the most energy is forming the deuterium. Deuterium, right. But de de deuterium forms in the early universe already. And so in a brown dwarf, it's not heavy enough, not massive enough to provide the collisions that will give, that will produce deuterium, but it can take the primordial deuterium, the stuff that was already there from the Big Bang, and fuse that into helium. And once you get below the deuterium fusion limit, then you kind of have a planet. And that, so it's kind of a, it depends. There's a lot of uh, murky gray area in there because, for example, if you have a, say you have a planet like Jupiter that is fusing deuterium. Um, say you have a, a, an object that is, say, 15 times the mass of Jupiter. Right. If it's gaseous all the way to the core, then it should be able to fuse deuterium in the core because that's where it's hottest and where there's enough um, energy to provide that fusion process. Right. However, if that same object has a large rocky core, then the fusion would have to happen on the surface of that rocky core, and it might not have the energy to do it. And so you can't just say, well, at this mass, you have a brown dwarf or not, because it depends upon the interior structure of the object. Right. And so that deuterium, um, I mean, so does this create within brown dwarf, dwarf? I, I, I'm so good with that word, guys. I'm so good with the word dwarf. It's amazing. I say dwarf all the yeah. time. It's so fun. It's just like Irish wristwatch. I can't, another. I can't even do it. I never can do it. Um, but it, I mean, so does that create like maybe a heavy hydrogen? Is that something? Yeah, so it, it can fuse heavy hydrogen into into regular helium. Okay, yeah, because I've I've written I've written papers on the whole proton to proton chain, and guys, don't worry, that is that is really, um, you know, for for being a it's it's something they discuss early in in uh well I'd say it's probably a one o two thing, but uh, going past that, they go really deep into that, and it's it's not an easy process when you start talking about fusion and how it actually happens, but um yeah, there's there's the the brown the brown dwarf stars are um you know about what they say anywhere between 10 or 13 uh jupiter masses so the mass of jupiter to about roughly what like 70 80 and then after that yeah, you start so 80 80 uh jupiter masses is the kind it's of getting close. limit that yeah, it's gets getting you close. the main sequence yeah you you're going to start creeping up on this this nice thing right here and you're start being like proxima centauri um, once you get to that. So, but back to your original question, which was rogue planets. Um, rogue planets. So we don't actually know. It's it's conceivable that you can form planet-like objects from the collapse of giant molecular clouds in the stars and other objects. Uh, but my suspicion is that the majority of uh, rogue planets are actually planets that form in multi-star systems or in um, planetary systems. So they form just like planets and then through gravitational interactions with either with other planets in the system or with nearby stars that pass through from the birth cluster um, will kick those planets out of the planetary system and they just wander the galaxy all by their lonesome selves. Um, and this is uh, the estimate is that it's basically a rogue planet per star, maybe a little bit more than that. So wait, there's... Wait, wait. So, half a trillion, basically. Half a trillion rogue planets in the galaxy. Whoa. Did you guys just get that? I'm just going to have him repeat it one more time. So so we say there's so there's one rogue planet per star. Roughly one rogue planet per star, which is half a trillion. Small numbers, guys. Small numbers. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. That's insane. So... And, and we can't see them again. You know, you know, the reason we see these things, guys, is because planets don't reflect or, or I'm sorry, planets don't emit light. They reflect light. So that's that's a huge part of all this, guys, is that planets don't emit light. They reflect light of the star that they're orbiting around. So when you get these rogue planets, you can't see them. So how do you detect a rogue planet? How do you how do you find one of these guys? Have we um, so these were all detected from the microlensing. Oh. Oh, okay. Let's let's. So rather than seeing a signal that's what you would get from a star, you get a signal that's what you get from just a planet by itself. 
Okay, so 47 planets, more info. Okay. Okay, so yeah, down here they actually have like one of these little things where they're showing the micro lensing even more of how you get that fun house effect. Um, interesting. And and what can we do? So we find these rogue planets and we're like, cool, we, we this guy doesn't have a, a star that he's around. He's just out in space. He's all alone. It's really, really cold, guys. It's not absolute zero, but it's really cold. Um, and and what do we what do we do with that? I mean, do they have any ideas of what they can do with that and research? I mean, where is that even going? Do you know any insight? Um, so what that would tell us is like once as we hammer as we continue to hammer out this number and like measure it more precisely. Um, so we have an estimate for what it should be. Uh, so someone asked in the chat, um, how do you get that number? You basically say, here's our microlensing survey, which is we look at this part of the sky for 90 nights. We see this many objects that would, qual would be categorized as rogue, rogue planets. If we were to look all over the whole sky all of the time, how many would we see? And you kind of do the, do the math to um, take you from a small sample to what's the size of the population. Um, so that's how we get that number. Yeah. Uh, what we can infer from that is that will give us some information about, um, as we understand more about how these things form, if they form in planetary systems or if they form as part of the star formation process, then we can further constrain how planets form. One of the, so we understand to a great deal how our own solar system formed with here's the ice line and Jupiter formed outside of it where stuff condenses into droplets and inside of that it's too hot and so you have to form, that's where the rocky stuff forms. And so we have a good story about how the solar system formed. But then when you look at other planetary systems, um, one of the numbers that I was going to mention earlier but didn't is the fact that Kepler-like planetary systems are around roughly a third of the stars that are out there. Um, so we have all of these other planetary systems that look nothing like the solar system mm -hmm. that there's you would there's no way taking our understanding of how the solar system forms that you would be able to predict kepler the systems that kepler has found or hot jupiters or these ultra short period planets on one day orbits and things like that and so um there's other kinds of monsters that are lurking in the forest and in order to have a general theory of planet formation, which properly predicts the number of solar system-like planets that you form and number of Kepler-like planets that you form and so forth, you have to kind of take in all of the information. So as we identify these rogue planets and as we understand more and more where they came from, that will help us understand how many planets should form in a typical system, where should they form, how long should it take them to form, and it puts our own solar system into this context of the broader um, planet formation process. Right. And, and, and that's, that's another thing, guys, we really don't understand a lot about these things. This is why we have the missions like Juno, um, which is right now going around Jupiter and, and, and its moons. And also the Cassini mission helped us learn more about Saturn and also things, uh, like Enceladus, which is one of its moons, also Titan. Um, and it's, it's interesting learning about our solar system because we're just seeing just so much diversity between solar systems. Like you can see that there's these hot Jupiters that form, you know, uh, next to the, the star or, you know, these are theories. And, and, and then we look at our solar system, we're like Jupiter's way out here. Um, there's nothing really uniform. And again, you know, s space has really no obligation to be uniform to us, it has no obligation to care at all what we think it should be. Um, it, it doesn't care about our feelings. It does not care as much as I don't care about Pluto's feel feelings, guys, space doesn't care about our feelings. So, um, but yeah, no, that's, and that's really interesting as far as that goes. Like I, I'm right now, I just pulled up one of the tables. I've actually looked at all this stuff before. Um, guys, I don't know if you know about this, but there is something called planethunters.org. Is, is there still data coming in from Kepler? I know the K2 missions going guys. And we, we didn't talk about the K2. I can give you kind of a brief synopsis of what the K2 is. It's, Basically, it was something that we uh, we took what we had of Kepler that was still kind of working and functional and it, what capability it did have. And it got approved, I think, you know, in 2014, but it, it it's doing other stuff now. If you want to actually, you can go ahead. I know that it's it's a little bit tricky to describe what it's doing, but it's doing other things. It's going a little bit deeper in, in terms of uh, deep sky objects. So the K2 mission 
um, it basically is the same Kepler spacecraft. Mm -hmm. um, so a mission in NASA speak is a combination of a spacecraft and a science objective. And so the Kepler mission was the Kepler spacecraft with the objective of measuring the frequency of Earth-like planets in the habitable zones of sun-like stars and had about half a dozen other specific science agendas or science uh, objectives in its agenda. Um, then when the reaction wheels failed and they had to put to do something else with the spacecraft, they renamed the mission as the K2 mission because it's a combination of the Kepler spacecraft plus the new mission to um, do these other kinds of observations. So what K2 does is they have a call for, it, it looks at a single part of the sky for three months at a time and it works its way around the ecliptic plane. So it points in along the orbit of the Earth's plane. Um, I'm sorry, along the plane of the Earth's orbit. Um, and it does that so that it can use the sun's radiation to balance out the fact that it's missing one of its, one of its wheels. And it it's looks broke. at a part of the sky for three <laughs> months at a time, and then it switches fields and looks at another part for three months and then switches again. And you propose, the way that it operates is that observers propose, I want this set of targets and this is the science that I'm going to do with it. Um, for example, I want to look at this particular star cluster to measure the frequency of planets in star clusters of this age. And, um, and then they get, they're allocated some number of targets, um, some number of pixels that they download and then can do their own analysis afterwards. Okay. That's, and yeah, so, and that's, that's still going on. So like, I, I know that cause I, I've actually done some of the planet hunter stuff it's it's planethunters.org. You can actually look in and look at these transits. I don't know if it's still going on. It was it was a few years ago that I did this, and I did this in my own free time because that's what norm, normal people do this. Um, but it's something that citizens can actually get involved with with detecting exoplanets because I know the data is just crazy. Um, yeah, there's a lot of data, um, and actually there are a number of citizen science um, things that you can do beyond planet hunting. Um, there, I think it's called Zooniverse. Is yes. The site. Yes. Um, and it has, yep. it, it has several different, it depends, you know, so if planets aren't your thing, if you prefer doing galactic structure, then there's um, other kinds of uh, projects that you can get involved with that involve, you know, related to other science areas besides planets. Of course, planets is the coolest, uh, but, um, but it's not necessarily everyone's cup of tea. Right. Well, uh, I mean, uh, so... The Kepler mission itself is going to end. The official mission is going to end this year. Mm -hmm. um, they're finalizing the data analysis. They're doing the final catalog of planet candidates, and that's supposed to be published this year. So this this calendar year is the year that Kepler funding, the original Kepler mission, will run out of money, mm -hmm. um, and the K K two mission will continue onwards after that. Right, and that and it's it's going to go for what? It it just got an extension in two thousand sixteen, didn't it? Got ex like it got, they allowed it to go on further. The K two mission, right? I think. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, and are, it should come up just basically every other year for what's called senior review, and that's where NASA decides which missions um, get cut and which ones get, um, replace them. Right. Right. Um. Okay. And I think that's that's really, oh, that's really good. I I definitely want um. Because I think I want to stick on this. I might have to call you back for like dark matter and dark energy. Because I think that's a whole different thing. And I also want to make sure that everybody is kind of also aware that we're going to be talking about that kind of stuff. Because that stuff, that's pretty dense material. Um, no pun intended on some of that. Um, but it's it's something that I think would be really good to talk about too. Because I really shy away from that. You guys you guys see me every time someone's like, I'll talk about dark energy. And I'm like, I, you know, um, I don't really know a lot about it. And I know that we don't know a lot about it. I know that we have some missions coming up that we're going to be studying. I believe it's dark matter. Is it? I think. Yeah. So there's, there are always things, there are always dark matter um, experiments that are ongoing. Um, I used to work at Fermilab and they were involved in, I think they're still involved in like four or five dark matter experiments. I used to work um, at Fermilab, you know, no big deal. Okay, go on. Those were, those, <laughs> those were the days. Um, that moving from Chicago to Las Vegas, a bit of a change, especially in February. Mm -hmm. um, but the, so they're ongoing experiments. They're, they're not typically funded through NASA. Um, most dark matter experiments are funded through the Department of Energy 
or the National Science Foundation. Great. <laughs> I'm sorry. All my, I'm just leaving that there. That's Department of Energy UK. Um, and so, uh, wonderful. Um, and yeah, I do, I definitely want to have a thing about that. So, and, and, um, yeah, cause I, I really, I know that a lot of people in here want to talk about dark energy and dark matter. And, and there's a lot of things that we do know sort of kind of, uh, it's, it's difficult because you just can't see the stuff. It's really hard to yeah. measure stuff when you can't see stuff, but you can see how things behave around. You can it. do, you can build experiments. So that's the when you declare victory is at a different threshold in dark matter. Right. Um, so. And that was so when I was at Fermilab, I I kind of was schizophrenic. I split my time between dark matter and dark energy experiments and and Kepler. Like you do. <laughs> um. So. Yeah. Uh, and that. Go that ahead. lasted for a while. It was it was really fun. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, now I basically focus almost entirely on exoplanets. Yeah, and uh, and you're gonna you're are you, did you say you're gonna be at TwitchCon? I I plan to be at TwitchCon. Um, I'll already be in the area because um, I'll be visiting uh, a few other places, and uh, so I'm anticipating being there for the whole for the whole thing, getting okay. some stuff printed up to pass out so that we can make make we can make astronomy great again um and on for... twitch guys and on twitch skylia science yeah. um you know this is yeah this is what we want to we want to do this because i think a lot of people really actually like astronomy and, and they don't know where to find it I think they that's... don't yeah like people they just i mean especially here and i think that there's such a um can I get one of my mods? Can you go and get the the vote thing from the Twitter? I think, goddamn Superman, you might actually have a link from that. Um, and if we could just post that in here, you guys can go and vote. We have this uh, Twitch voice vote thing for for getting this kind of stuff on Twitch and, and opening up an educational channel, so that homegirl here and and a professor here doesn't have to be on IRL. Because as much as we like being in IRL. Um, it's, it's a little awkward. You have to scroll down like 80 pages to get to. Yeah. To... Yeah. I'll be smashed between, uh, you know, smushed between very different kinds of streamers. Um, and I feel a little out of place sometimes. Um, but it's okay. This is where we're at right now. And I think, I think Twitch, Twitch just needs to hear it from everybody else that, you know, I, I would be a lot more comfortable if, if I could be drinking some beers with some education and doing some some astronomy talks that way and also supporting other people doing education stuff. I think at this point we should actually see if anybody has any questions for you. And then after this, guys, we're not done. After this, I'm going to uh, go to space. I'm actually going to get, before you go too, I want to get a few, uh, give me a few exoplanets that I can go look at that you think that are pretty interesting and I'll see if if uh, Space Engine has them. I'm pretty sure a doctor could be like, yeah, we have that one or no, we don't. Um, okay, but yeah, um, let's. So yeah, give me those. Give me interesting. Give me a few. So some of my favorites: uh, Kepler thirty six. Okay. And another one. <laughs> he has to pull up um, his list. He's like, "This is too many." Thank you, uh, so Joe. Kepler thirty six. Uh, Kepler sixteen. Mm -hmm. Kepler eleven. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. What's that one called? It's KOI 808 or 806. 806? Um, but that's it's got that, a Kepler name. Right, because KOI just means a Kepler object of interest, right? Uh, it looks like Kepler 30. And the most interesting system in the world, in the most interesting planetary system in the world. So I was talking to the, I've, I've given this talk at a number of conferences, and I say, um, you know, I was talking to the most interesting man in the world, and he said that, uh, Who's that? Visit all Who's that? Systems. You have to tell me who that Most is. Most interesting man in the world. Yes. The, the Dosecki's. Uh... <laughs> Go on. So he, said he, he doesn't visit all planetary systems, but when he does, he prefers Wasp Forty Seven. Oh, I know about that one, but we'll go to that one too. Wasp Forty Seven. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, we'll go to that to in VR tonight, guys. Um, so we're not done. Even though we'll, we'll, he'll, he, and he might hang around. I don't know if he has, I'm not going to keep him um, tethered to the stream, but we're going to go into some VR action in space and I'll, I'll go and look at a few of these things tonight and 
So right now we can have him uh, answer some questions if you guys have some questions. And then after that, we're going to we're gonna go VR space stuff. So if anybody has any questions right now, now Sounds would be good. the time. Now would be the time. And thank you so much for your time tonight, too. Oh, you got yeah, one absolutely. question. You got one question. So Dr. Jason, what can be done to speed up the process of astronomic discovery, lobbying for more funding, education, et cetera? Controller asks. Controllers and... So um, funding is, I think, the main thing. Um, right now, NASA, as a fraction of the federal government, uh, of the federal budget, NASA is the lowest it's been since the 1950s. Um, it gets, NASA gets about less than half a percent of the federal budget. It peaked in the, in the Apollo mission era at about 5%, so it's about 10 times the current funding level um, per federal dollar. Um, and the the, da- the issue that comes up with with funding when when there's funding across, cuts across the board is that most of the research that's done through a, a lot of the discoveries that are done from NASA are done from uh, professor university professors and their graduate students like this and guy those <laughs> yeah I mean it's and true so, though it's true it's true when when they cut funding to NASA. It's not like oh they just cut funding you know from everything because it's still you still have to pay the guards at the NASA facilities you still have to mow the lawn you still have to flush the toilets all that stuff still goes on and so all the discretionary funding comes out of the research budget so when NASA gets cut say five percent that ends up cutting almost in half the amount of money available for research because they have to keep the lights on right so. Okay, and so- and what, what they're actually saving when they cut money from NASA is a small hiccup in some of the major programs because NASA's budget is so tiny. It's like if you want to, if you want to clean up your inbox in your email inbox, you need to sort things by size and look at the largest emails, not the one kilobyte um, emails that are at the bottom of the list. Anyway, so that's so funding is is the elephant in the room in terms of um, scientific discovery. Yeah, there's a lot we could do if we had more. Yeah, it'd be great. So anyways, back on. No, but that's, I mean, that's, that's, it's, it's true. Um, so, and, and I, I don't think we, we, I don't think we have scientific bias in this at all either, but, but no, it is, it is something that is really, you know, I mean, for anything, uh, you know, I, I know we get into that kind of stuff and I always tell people to, to, to listen, we're not talking from a perspective of political anything. We're actually just talking about we want to we want to be able to do some some stuff guys and we actually want to be able to solve some problems and we that that's just a necessary thing you need um in order to be able to do that you you have to be able to to get people to do that so um it's it, that's pretty much so write just... your congressman if, if you like what you see then write your congressman right and it actually does matter yeah um so uh it looks like we've got yeah so we want to send an unmanned mission to an exoplanet someday what criteria do we use to pick one um I think to send an unmanned mission to an exoplanet. That's a good the question. The most important thing is that it be close. Yes, um, time would, time is of the essence, right? Because if you have if you send an exoplanet mission to uh, something that is ten light years away, and you want to communicate to your satellite, it will take twenty years to get the signal out to the satellite and back. And so proximity will be everything. Right. Um, That's and why so the trap is system. what you right? want to do is say. Here's the kind of planet we want to find. What's the closest one? And that's how you. Right. And that's that's tricky to do because like the Trappist system, everybody got so excited about it. And, and we should be excited about it. It's super cool. It's super weird. And it's just awesome. And it's amazing. Um, but, you know, again, the, the aspect of time, uh, you know, that that that's that system is about 39 light years away. Um, and that's traveling at the speed of light. So. Yeah. You gotta. It would you, take a century to, to communicate with it, right? So, so you, we don't we don't live that long, guys. Um, and so he has another question: What would make an exoplanet most attractive to explore based on what we're able to detect currently? That probably, if you're talking about an unmanned mission to some distant object, and I'm not convinced um, that we would ever send a mission. It, it will be a while before We'd a mission even like think, that happens, right? Um, my guess would be that what the taxpayer, what the human race would be most interested in is a planet that's like the Earth. 
Um, and so that would be, the, we'd pick the nearest planet that we would optimize over the proximity to us and the, and the likeness that that object has to the Earth, how similar it is to the Earth and how close it is. And then from that you would say, and when you have to balance these two things, what's the best target? And then that's the one you would go for. Right. Let's see, we got, um, where's James Webb Telescope looking to first? Where, or has that not been planned yet? Um, so James Webb Space Telescope, it has a few, I might, so I don't know a whole lot about the science agenda for it. I know more of its capabilities. Um, James Webb is kind of like a user facility. It's a telescope that you can apply to uh, to, t to get time on. Um, you basically submit a proposal that says, I want to use James Webb Space Telescope to look at this object and um, to measure this property, and this is why that's an important observation to make. And then there's a committee, and I've served on these kinds of committees, where you basically rank order. These are This is the order I would put these proposals, and they go down the list and say, okay, we run out of time at this point, and then they cut it off, and people above that line get time, and people below it um, submit the next cycle. Um, and so really it will probably be chosen. The first field that it gets looked at, the first field that it looks at will be chosen by the engineers. The third field that it looks at will be chosen by a scientist that submits a pro proposal. Oh, okay. And that's how, that's how they probably also work with Hubble too, right? Yeah. Hubble um, works that way. So Kepler K2 mission works that way. Okay. Um, the Spitzer Space Telescope works that way. Um, and so that's kind of the direction that those facilities, um, when they when they operate in observer mode, guest observer mode, you apply for time, just like you would a ground-based telescope, and you make the case for why that time is valuable. Oh, Spider-Ham, thank you for the host. Okay, so we, that's, yeah, that's really interesting, actually, because I had no idea about how that process worked. Um, Connor Black says, Dr. Jason, at what scale does the Earth become smaller than a subatomic particle? Um, that doesn't happen. Uh, it will, the Earth, are, are you asking what's the scale of a subatomic particle? Um, and, and the answer scale? to that question is we actually don't know. Uh, we don't know the physical size of, we know the physical size of a proton, um, which is about one, 10 to the minus 15 meters, whatever that makes. So that's very billion, small. Trillion. It's one trillionth of a meter is the size of a proton. Um, and, but the proton itself is not fundamental. It's made out of three quarks. Um, we don't know the physical size of quarks um, or if they even have a physical size. Most of the mass of a proton is actually not from the quarks. It's from the energy field that binds the quarks together. Um, Here's some nice so, quantum mechanics for you guys. <laughs> here's, some, here's some study of the very small is what we call it. Um, and, and I, I appreciate you humoring that cause that's totally not what we're talking about, but that's, if you want to like package that just so I don't, I don't want people thinking we're going to go into this cause we, we can have a stream and I, and I do plan to have a stream where we're going to get into more of this, this really thick material. It's not, I, I just don't want anybody in here to be scared and be like, Oh my God, what are they doing? Um, but you can, you can still finish that if you want to <laughs> that question. <laughs> cause that's, so that's a good one. We've got, uh, is Nibiru real? Uh, I doubt it. Um. <laughs> Not likely. Um, and the person who started the mission has to be alive when it ends. They like to be. Alan Stern, absolutely. I mean, that was that was some of the things with this whole Pluto mission, the New Horizons mission is, you know, Pluto's, Pluto's far away. And, and you really, that's why they made it um, as small as they did and also put on some some nice rockets, some boosters that could could really get that guy out there, and then flinging it by Jupiter and getting that gravitational assist was so really good. It doesn't it, it doesn't always happen though. It doesn't um, always happen, right? For example, with Kepler, so the original proposal for Kepler was in 1983, um, and it was 20 years later when it was selected for um, to be launched, and it was two guys in particular, Bill Baruki and Dave Koch. And Bill Baruki is still alive, but Dave Koch died after um, basically six months or a year of operations. Oh. Um, well, he did so get I mean, to see I'm, it go, though, right? So 
After he, he was there when it launched. Um, he was there for the first. He was on the first few discovery papers, and then he had Lou Gehrig's disease and ended up passing away shortly after that. Hey, doctor. Thanks for the bits. I appreciate that. Ten bits from a doctor. Um, and let's see. So that's 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 a good point. So it doesn't necessarily. I was about to say because Johannes has been long gone. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, guys. That's who the mission's named after. Um, and so. Let's see, peeing 20 years later, yep, that's that's pretty much how that works. Um, well, a bill is just sign which puts more focus on space exploration, we will see. Um, and tweeting something, do you have a Twitter? Do you have a Twitter, Doctor? I do have a Twitter. Um, it's uh, HorizonSci, at HorizonSci. And if I may, I also have a, a Twitch channel. Yes, please um, do. I don't, um, I'm, I'm able to stream a couple hours uh, a week. Um, I have kids, and so that takes up Understood. most of my evenings. Understood. Um, but I do have a, a Twitch channel and a Twitter thing where I basically announce, like, here's what I'm going to talk about. And for the most part, I capture the videos um, and have them for up for display. Uh, I did a recent one on um, what what they were talking about in the movie uh, Hidden Figures. Mm-hmm. Like what was the what was the importance of the problem that they were trying to solve, and what was this Euler's method that they talked so much about? Um, I don't know how good of a job I did, but it's up there. I might do it again. Um, it's a little bit easier to, when you're interacting with an audience to make sure that um, everyone's following along. Right, and I, I actually did follow him myself, guys. So, um, and I would love to have these kind of things more often with him too. These kind of um, like combining communities too to see just. In general, I think it's just good to have variety. Like he definitely is a teacher, um, and and I'm not. Um, and and everybody's in here. They're like, do you notice that Sky hasn't sworn once? And that's mostly because like I do have respect for academia. There's and and I, and in an interview like this, I'm, I'm I can, you know, that's that's not the time and the place. When I'm interacting with you guys, that's different. And when I'm interacting with him in chat, that's different. Um, but there is a respect that I do have. Uh, for the people that take the years and the time and, and the grit that it takes to get through these kind of professions and then to pass on the knowledge to other people. It's a, it's a very selfless career. And so um, it's something that's why you guys haven't heard me do that. So don't worry, I have a bunch saved up for all of you guys, right? When, we, when we're done, don't worry, I'm just going to start launching it. Um, and so let's see, let's see, let's uh, tweeting you something. Okay, thanks for the answer. Really appreciate it. Um, I have developed Mars Millennial Plan, if anyone's interested. <laughs> um, and then I think there's also a deterioration of data as the single, signal spreads, someone says, I think. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe. Uh, where's that one? Someone, Connor Black, um, way up there. Like, compared to the galaxy. I, I don't, we haven't, I mean, again, like, uh, our galaxy is about 100 thousand light years across so top to is bottom. there deterioration of data as the signal spreads um so i guess it depends on what specifically connor is talking about if you're talking about quantum measurement then you do get deterioration as the wave unless you have a soliton wave um which is a wave that retains its structure um then the wave packets tend to quantum mechanical wave packets tend to spread out, which means you get less and less information the farther away you are from an initial measurement. Um, but if you're talking about, uh, for example, with Kepler, now that the Kepler mission has been flying for eight years, mm -hmm. it's actually quite a ways away from the Earth. And as a consequence, the only way that we can communicate it is through the deep space network, which is how we communicate to planetary science missions. Mm -hmm. And that's actually one of the largest expenses of the K2 mission is using that network. Yeah, the DSN. Because um, it's, it's, it's not your, it's not AOL. Um, and the farther away it gets, the longer it takes to download the information because there's a lot of handshaking involved to make sure that the data isn't corrupted. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, we should send our most enthusiastic person on Mars to Mars. Okay, Skylia, suit up. <laughs> uh, no, uh, but if but they don't have Twitch on Mars right now, so we I know. Don't want to do that. Yeah, we. I gotta hold off, guys. I still gotta be here for you. Um, I, I really just don't want to be. I, I don't know about you, but I just don't think I could actually be around. That's a long mission. Um, <clears throat> to be in close quarters with people as well. Um, 
I'm not a teacher, Sky, so just wrapping up the day's list. No, I'm, I'm not. I, I just talk to you guys about science, and I get you guys intrigued. Uh, it's my goal to to get you guys interested in thinking, and then then you guys can check out these resources, such as, um, you know, like his channel. So how, <laughs> how to counter flat earthers. Right, and we have um, a flat earth. I've actually, flat earth. Wait, can I've, we get I've some flat earth? I've been thinking earths? about that. Guys, flat earth in the chat. Okay, go on. I've actually been thinking about that. Um, how do you counter flat earthers? Uh and I, I really think that, because I've actually, because of this one issue, I mean, most of my students aren't flat earthers, right? It takes a very unique brain to, to be a flat earther. <laughs> um, that's, that's a nice euphemism. That was so well delivered. <laughs> Go on. Um, and so I've been thinking of restructuring my intro to classes to basically say, here's what you need to explain. Um, so we need to explain uh, why the stars rise in the east and set in the west. How can we come up with an explanation for this? And then propose a couple explanations for why stars rise in the east and set in the west, and then say, what other predictions can you make based on this model? And then can we test that? And basically show how the scientific method has removed flat earth from being a viable option. Um, but really, so starting fundamentally saying, you have to be able to explain all of the observations with your theory. And so if you want to prove Einstein wrong, which always makes the headlines, um, if you want to prove Einstein wrong, you have to be able to explain why Einstein has been right so far with your theory. And over and over again. I mean, we gravitational yeah. gravitational waves, um, I mean, we're finding them now. They're, they're starting to lose their novelty and... Um, which is not a bad thing because that just opens up a whole new realm of science for people who want to study this, uh, I'd like to say phenomenon, but it's, it's, it is, but I mean, I mean that the whole LIGO thing. And that's another thing I want to talk about with him too. Like this guy's going to be back. I'm, I'm not letting him go because he's got some insight on, on, you know, um, like, like you guys are saying, the study of the very small, some quantum and also uh, gravitational waves. I'm sure he has, I know, actually, he has um, some stuff about that that he could talk about. And, again, I want to make sure that if I'm delivering any kind of really solid information that it's coming from somebody that's that's earned their degree in that, that regard. Um, is there anybody else that said anything? Let's send Matt Damon. Okay, I, I have a question, though, for you. What is your favorite mm -hmm. sci-fi movie? Favorite sci-fi movie? Mm-hmm. You know, like Interstellar? Okay, so if I think about like the Phantom Menace, it's probably not that one. Um, <laughs> favorite sci-fi movie? Back to the Future. That one's a good one. That's a that's a good one. So I I have I haven't um, most of the movies that I watch now when I go to the theater are like Cars, um, Planes. Uh, oh yeah, like no, that. I do Minions I do want to. I do. I know now. Now it just sounds like you have kids again. I. I, I know. I know. I, <laughs> no, I do want to actually. I, I wanted to talk about this real quick. So sorry. Um, what are you most known for? If I were to Google your name, because I actually did read that whole article and it was super interesting. So, uh, my my biggest claim to fame is the Stefan method of boarding airplane passengers. Um, it is the currently the world record holder for the fastest way to get passengers onto an airplane. I have that here somewhere. Where is it? Your website. And then if I go down here, uh, links to media coverage. He's been on NPR. Where is it? Where is your, oh, there it is. Right here. Guys, Wired Magazine. Yeah. <laughs> Wired Magazine. Um, but this is not it. This is, this is dark matter. This is your dark matter talk. But wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. This is it. Where is the picture? There's no photo. Um, cuz I thought there was a photo. Oh, never mind. <laughs> that's embarrassing and <laughs> blocking ads. <laughs> but no, that's it right there. Um, so you guys can actually I'm going to link this right now into the chat because I'm a jerk and I'm blocking ads on Wired. Um, I actually have Twitch whitelisted guys because I'm a firm believer in supporting streamers. So, um, but yeah, he go on, go on and tell about that real quick. So now everybody has the, the link so they can look at it. So when I when I started working on this project, um, this was in 
the winter of 2007. Um, we're coming up on the Christmas holidays when Fermilab empties out and everyone leaves Chicago. Um, that, that was one thing I never understood. Like, there's this idea where, like, for the holidays you're supposed to travel, and because you're supposed to be with family for the holidays. But the whole reason you were with family for the holidays was because it was the worst time of the year to travel, <laughs> and you were stuck in your cabin with your family. And now, to to maintain the thing, we have to fly all anyway. So that's a different subject. But as we were leading into the holiday season, I was like, well, I need to stop thinking about this project. I either need to figure out what the fastest way to board airplane passengers is or I need to stop thinking about it and move on to something else. And so uh, I wrote a piece of code. I already knew the answer because I was such a smart guy. It was like, well, clearly you board from the back to the front because obviously. Um, yeah, obviously. So I, <laughs> I, I wrote some code. I lined up my passengers. I sent them in um, uh, back to front, got how long it would take to fill the airplane. And then I said, well, let's see how much better it is than the worst possible way to board airplanes, which is from the front to the back. So I reversed the order of all the passengers, boarded them from the front to the back, measured the amount of time that it took, and it was almost exactly the same amount of time. And you hear so that, I thought, guys? Okay, this. You guys hear that? Is... So, so we all think that, because I've thought that before. I've thought that. Board them from, yeah, why are we doing it this way? So he tried to do it the reverse, and it took almost the same amount of time. Okay, go on. Sorry. So... Uh, so that struck me as, well, there's something wrong with my code. So I spent the next day or so going through my code, making sure that I didn't make any mistakes. Um, I actually made a little thing that would make a movie out of it, out of ASCII text, where the passengers were exclamation points marching <laughs> across the screen. Um, I bet that was sweet, guys. It was, it was pretty cool. So you <laughs> scroll down and you could watch the waves of people move in. So then I put it into a type of um, optimization algorithm that we use a lot in astronomy for data analysis called uh, Markov Chain Monte Carlo. If you ever want to sound cool, you can um, say that to your friends at a party. Like when I go to a party, I'm like, hey, have you ever heard of Markov Chain Monte Carlo? And they're like, no, I've never heard of that. That's so awesome. <laughs> um, so the, the idea is that you basically just switch passengers, switch random pairs of passengers and board them and see if it boards faster or not. And what I was looking for is what is the optimum seat separation between adjacent passengers in line? How, if I'm in line, how far away from me, how many seats away from me should the guy behind me be? And how far away from, from me should I be from, how many seats away should I be from the person in front of me? Like rows? So, um, so I did it by seat number. Um, okay. So the rows was you just take that number and divide by six. Um, and it turned out that the number that I got when I ran it through this was to uh, have them separated by two rows, which is the amount of space that I required in my computer software for them to put their luggage away, um, that they needed to have one row of empty space to put their luggage away. And so then I said, well, let's just run with this and space everybody out by that same distance. And so I did that and it ran like 10 times faster. It was so much faster. Uh, and the insight that came from that was that the problem with boarding from the back to the front is that the back row takes six people. And if you line everyone up so that the back row goes in first, then you have six people all trying to get into the same row. And you get just get a big bottleneck. Um, the line initially moves very fast because everyone fills up the airplane. But then no, only one person at a time can do anything as they sit down. What you want to have is you want everyone to go into the airplane and anyone who's in the airplane is putting their stuff away and sitting down and getting out of the way of everybody else. And so the best way to do that is to make sure that adjacent passengers in line are sitting far enough apart from each other that they don't get in each other's way. Huh. Um, and so when you do that, uh, you get what is now called the Stefan method. I have it up um, on my screen right now. Um, one of your and it's way faster it's the fastest airline in the industry now is southwest who does the open seating where you can go in and sit wherever you want mm -hmm. uh, which is not the same thing as random um it's it's different random would be you have assigned seats and you're put in line in order randomly where open seating is you come in and you look at the airplane and you make a decision and you sit down um, in a seat based upon what the current state of the seats are um and but you want to so Southwest is the fastest, and I was contacted by um, a couple guys. One of them is the guy, uh, St John Hotchkiss. He did Punkin' Chunkin', the documentary Punkin' Chunkin'. Um, he contacted me to do um, a TV show about 
putting my method against other methods. Um, and then I was contacted by Nova to go against Southwest Airlines. And, and I beat Southwest Airlines by like 30%. Um, and I and think so, you, we can find uh, that all on your webpage, can't we? Yeah, you can, you can find it there. Um, it was on, the series was making stuff faster. Um, or the series was making stuff too, and the episode was making stuff faster. And that's where it actually talks about like the UPS delivery, like why UPS only makes right turns instead of left turns in their delivery um, routes. Uh, there's a question, did anyone from the industry ever call me? Uh, the answer to that is I did get a few phone calls, but nothing has ever come of them. I was contacted by Virgin. I was contacted by Air Seychelles, which is the airline company for the Seychelles Islands, which is actually where my method makes a lot of sense because they have airports that are only 10 kilometers apart from each other. Um, and so the turnaround time is a huge fraction of the flight time. Um, but no one has bitten so far, sadly. Yeah, and I got I got your thing up right here, and it talks about because he did do a TED talk, so all that stuff, and then there's the airplane stuff. If you guys click on those links, because I did actually watch that, um, I watched a few of those, uh, the ones that he's describing, um, and so yeah, that's 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 what he's known for. It. I thought it was super cool because I was like, if if Wired contacted me, I don't know if I'd believe it. He's like, yeah, I didn't think so either. Um, but I, I, I walked in the next morning. Because I posted it on the archive where um, people put, because I, I know, I mean, that's where all my friends, like my colleagues look for new results. And so I was like, well, I'll post it on archive, which is uh, a clearinghouse for new scientific literature. Um, so whenever I publish a new paper, I post it on this free, anyone can access it. It's a free site where you can go get this, the scientific papers and read them. Um, so I posted it on archive. And then the next morning I had a message on my, it's like, hi, I'm a reporter from Wired Magazine. And 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 i was like this can't be real because uh, i mean who who cares about what i'm doing um and it, so the first person that contacted me was actually Fizzorg, but then later that day i was contacted by three or four others including wired um so it kind of took a life of its own it was right right so yeah he has a 10 minute uh ted talk it's pretty much everything we just talked about a little bit but it's obviously a ted talk and uh and let's see, um, it, yeah, it's all right here and there. And you guys remember he does, can I get another shout out for him? He does stream um, here and there. And we're going to have him back on to talk about gravitational, gravitational, <laughs> can't even speak anymore, waves and um, some of this other uh, stuff, this particle physics and stuff. Um, he's, he's actually got some really interesting stuff there. Uh, Cam... Cam said, uh, would that logically be back to front, though? How is the stuff in method? Oh, well, you, you guys can see that um, on here. There's actually, I've already highlighted making stuff faster. Um, you can click on that link and actually watch that. Um, but I definitely, yeah, there we go. Um, thank you guys for being so supportive. Gravitational waves, yeah, we'll, we can talk about that, and he's going to, yeah, that's again one of those things where Einstein again just made us all stop and and just go, okay, all right, we get it. You were real good. You were real good. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. And guys, it, if you he'll he might be here. I don't know. I'm not gonna stick him here. But if he is, and you guys want to talk to him, and you have questions, and you can always feel free to answer questions. I always appreciate it because whenever I have people yeah. that can help me fill in the gaps, it's great. Yeah, a lot of times, well, you, you get a lot of questions that come in, and there's only so much that you can, right. that one person can, <laughs> so I, I whisper to people often about, like, and oh, that's yeah, great. what's going on. Yeah, I appreciate that kind of help, because um, it's good. So I will, um, I can probably tune in a little bit later. I need to get my kids to bed. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been camping the last couple of days, and it's, oh. they're all very tired. Yes. And um, what is his Twitch stream? It's right above there. The mountains are calling, and we had to answer. Yes, definitely. It's right up here on... I'm just going to copy and paste. Yeah, this other people are doing it too. Right here, guys. Um, so we will have him back. And he does come in here. He is a member of Skynet. And so uh, he is in here quite a bit, especially with the space stuff. So um, thank you again, and you have a wonderful evening. All right, you too. Thanks a lot. All right, bye. All right, guys. It's you and me now. And I'm so glad that all you motherfuckers hung around. I am so glad that you guys decided to stay around.